Good morning everyone and uh, welcome to the west coast of uh, South Africa. I am in a very very special place and I am in a heritage site which is called Iquatu. Iquatu is just a few kilometers away from Cape Town and it's on the west coast of South Africa. And why is Iquatu so important? Because this is the village where the sun culture is still preserved and is still very well alive today. So I have decided to meet with this wonderful lady called uh, Nashada, who is uh, a son by origin as well. So she comes from the population of the original sons. And one of the important things is about the sons is that we will be able finally to talk today about not the encounters with the Europeans when they arrived in South Africa, but even what was their story before the, the Europeans arrived. So I'm not going to talk anymore for a while. I'm just going to ask some questions to uh, Nashada and I'll pass the word to her now and she will uh, induce us into a lot, a lot of little pearls and diamonds. Good afternoon, everybody. Avete capito qualcosa? Adesso ci spiega. Uh, did you understand anything? Now she will tell us. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Nasada. I'm a queer lady. I come from a sand community. I am now here in Kwatu, a heritage sand center. So I'm going to take you guys on a tour called Food for Our Forefathers. So this is a tour uh, based on archaeological evidence. And here you guys are going to learn about the early humans before the sand people. And then we are going to come to the sand history. So this tour inside this building, there is very much more information, but we are only going to touch on few which is important for everyone to know. So let's move ahead to the building. And welcome to Iquatu, because we are going to discover a lot of treasures today. And then welcome to the building called First People. Uh, like I've mentioned uh, before, this building has many, many, much more information I'm going to touch on here. And this tour that we are going to do is based on archaeological evidence. Who are these people? Where do I get this information from? I get this information from these archaeologists, the scientists. They are a very special breed of people. They have a special way of doing their things and they have much patience. To walk into a cave for maybe the, some of them work 30,000 years or 30 years uh, digging through layers of layers of dirt trying to find evidence of these early humans. They work with tiny spades, with tweezers and brushes. So let's go inside and go and find out. So in these buildings, there is two sides. This side is only about archaeological evidence, where this side is only about sand stories. So I'm going to start with the stories, and then we are going to go and touch on the archaeological evidence of these early humans. And I'm going to take one painting, and this painting is about human creation. So what the sand people believe is, before humans were human, they were first animals, all half animal and half human. That's why they can easily communicate with each other, they can understand each other, and they lived in peace and in harmony. But in the center of all the art, you'll find there's the elephant. The elephant is a symbol of God, so what the same people, or what we believe is that uh, when humans were created, the elephant was the one who leads them to where uh, they were supposed to be, where the elephant knew there was food for them, there was water, and there was space for them to hunt. So this is same stories, and this is how we learn, and this is how we share our stories or our message, and this has been passed on from generation to generation until it reached to us. 
So now we are going to go ahead and if there's any questions you can ask. And then if you see there are, sometimes you'll find some stories are the same, but the painting looks different. But it says the same message, like that one that I've started with. And here you can clearly see that it is about creation. And as well as this one, but the paintings are different, but it's the same story. Some of the stories are there to teach a lesson. Some of the stories share a message. Some of the stories is about where to find food, where to find water, and how to live in the nature. So we can go ahead and you can see some of the stories along our way. is called Kwa Kwa. So Kwa Kwa is in a narrow language. So Kwa Kwa is a very unique book because that everything that stands in the book is done by the same people who are the narrows. So first they take the story, uh, they paint the story first and then from the paintings they take it in a written form. So they write the story in their language and then from there, they translate the story in English. So for everyone to understand the story. If I'm not wrong, the language is actually still alive. I mean, it's still spoken today. Yes. And it, how, how long does it date back? How many uh, mille millennials actually? Uh, based, on the, based on the evidence that we got from the archaeologists, they say that uh, from the early humans, uh, when the early humans evolved into the sand, you'll find that the sand culture is coming from up to 4,000 years ago. So that means is this language is coming from up to 4,000 years ago. So it's a unique language. And I can hear when you speak that you use a lot of clicks. Yeah. So you can, you can only do it. I won't be able to do it because my tongue gets stuck. <laughs> <laughs> but um, when, you, when you use this language, it, uh, it makes me think of the other African languages, especially South African yeah. languages. Uh, don't forget that we have 11 official languages in, uh, in South Africa. And uh, the cliques are also part of the Kosa um, and the Zulu. So one thing that, that, that I think is important uh, to mention is that probably it was an evolution towards those languages as well. So Yeah. So we will find that the African people also have cliques. So they only have three cliques and they are alphabetical. They use the letter C, the letter Q and the letter X. When it comes to the same people, we only use um, uh, like symbols. So the symbols are our cliques. So we have five clicks. So these five clicks is uh, exclamation mark, uh, one forward slash, two forward slashes, a hashtag sign, and then there is one uh, click, which is a circle and a dot in the middle. So if you take all these clicks and say them all together in one, it sounds like this. So those are our clicks that we use. So ours is just symbols, and then the African people use alphabetical clicks. So you will also find that when the Kwe Kwe people arrived here uh, in uh, 2000 years ago, when they arrived, they arrived from East Africa and they met us here, the sand people. The Kwe Kwe met the sand people here. The thing is they didn't speak click language. When they met the sand people, that's when this combination came. They borrowed the clicks from us, which they never returned to us. So historically, what, you, what you're telling us is first the sons were originating actually from here yes. and then the Khoi Khois arrived from uh, various other African countries. Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> so that's a very interesting part of the history also because going back to the language that uh, um, uh, Nashada was actually mentioning a moment ago, it's a plan of the South African government to uh, add another language into the spoken languages that are already 12 as recognized and the Khoi language is another language that they are planning to um, bring on board uh, over the next few years. So I guess they are planning to, to, to add the Khoi language but there is also always going to be a difference because if they add the Khoi language uh, that language is not going to be part of us because we are sad. So the difference between this group is the Khoi Khoi people, they are herders and farmers. When you come to the sand people, we are just 
hunters and gatherers and our language differs as well. So that language will be added as official language, but the same language is not going to be added because the Kwe Kwe is a different language, the same language is a different one. Where you'll find the same has 13 different languages, which means there's 13 different groups. And then if you call the uh, call or if you count the same people together, you'll find this 130,000 same people all over Southern Africa. So if they add the same language, which means they'll have to add uh, one out of these 13 languages, maybe. Wow, it's, it's, it's incredible. Um, the stories are super fascinating. Uh, I'm just walking through the posters and uh, showing you how they were um, looking after themselves so the healers were actually the doctors uh, but we're going to get into that subject a little bit later i just want to turn the camera around when i finish with this poster and prove you that we are indeed in the west coast of south africa on the other side um, south america but as you can see we are really on the coast and this is the Atlantic Ocean at 60 de 16 degrees if at the maximum. We're over to another very interesting room now because I think there's quite a lot to talk about on this on this room, right? So this is the very important part in this building to talk about. So if you stand here you'll see it says your ancestors come from Africa, welcome home. I'm going to highlight it for you all. And then the question is, whose ancestors? My ancestors, your ancestors, whose ancestors? It's our ancestors. That's why it says your ancestors come from Africa, welcome home. So, the Archaeologists believe that uh, 250,000 years ago, humans were only found in this part of Africa and then nowhere else. And so that's the fact. This is just to explain to um, our followers uh, what you see is actually uh, the shape of Africa, the bottom of the continent, actually. I believe that you can see the lines. I mean, this would obviously be the Cape, and then it proceeds. So, this lifted part is um, the bottom of the continent. So, if you can see this color coded uh, dots, is the caves where these people used to live, and that's where uh, this evidence was found. So, these archaeologists they wanted to know about these people's lifestyle, what they were eating, and how they were thinking at that time. So, my question to you guys is, if you want to know more about someone, what will you do when I get in contact with that person and ask that person about themselves? What will you do to know more about them? What will you do to know more about me without asking me? So, sometimes people say, I will check on Facebook or I will go on YouTube. So, what these people did was, is the same as what people are going to do today. I'm going for a holiday vacation. So I'm going to take a blessed, uh, black plastic bag full of rubbish and leave it outside and then I'll go for my holiday vacation. Somebody will come, they will open this plastic bag and then that's where they are going to see how many bills do I pay, do I have a baby, will they find a diaper in there, do I eat a two minute noodles, am I an alcoholic, do I smoke? So that's the same that the author just did. They went to these people's, they went to these people's rubbish heap. That's where they dig in through layers of layers. That's where they found a uh, human skull, animal bones, plants of remain, cultural item, and then stone tools. So this is how they found about these people. But because the this is very old and it's very unique, they didn't want it to name it a rubbish heap but they say it's archaeological evidence. So, uh, why was people only found in this part of Africa and not other places, the part of Africa? Sorry, when, when she went the other part of Africa is, I'm just gonna point it out with the camera uh, just now, but that's actually the Cape region. Yes. So what she was highlighting a second ago is this area, which is in fact the Cape region. So, because of the other parts at that time, 
was a desert. And then the only place where you'll find vegetation is here around this western cave or along the coast. So people left here and it's also easier for them to go and collect seafood or they can either stand in the land and the landscape and then maybe they can go out and then hunt or they can eat these draft tolerant food like your watsonias which is um, an energy food to them. Watsonia is a draft tolerant food that grows underground and it is uh, almost like a potato. They take it and pre-cook it in the fire. And then, at the same time, if the coastline pulls back, they will follow the coastline. That's where they're going to eat the seafood. So that's their brain food. So this is what helped them develop their brain. So let's go to our timeline and see how things changed when they were eating the brain food and when they were eating the energy food. And these things that you see here, these are our Sadlin pioneers. I'm, I'm going to go slowly, so if the people following us want to take screenshots uh, of, um, actually I should start from the beginning, uh, your ancestors came from Africa, so that's what we just read on the big board a moment ago, but <clears throat> it, there is an explanation, if you want to create, take screenshots, you're allowed to, um, there's, it's no secretive, but uh, uh, you can keep it as a record if you'd like to. Yeah. So here we have a complete chronology of uh, the human origins and the sun. So these are our satellite pioneers. So the satellite pioneers were established uh, because of the same stories. Some of the time you'll find that anthropologists or scientists maybe go to a same place and they will write the stories. Some of the stories are made up by them. Some of the stories are not true. That's why we decided to uh, create a satellite pioneer group where this group of young people can take the stories from the communities and bring it to Kwata so that we can put it into these heritage centers. And these uh, stories that come from the community is almost like a first-hand information. It's straight from the people itself into the heritage center and not mistake or not a myth. So some of them come from Namibia, some of them from Botswana, some of them from South Africa. Tekla Karakambe here is a niece of mine, so she was also a satellite pioneer and came to this place via her to come and do my internship. The question is, uh, a lot of people are probably asking themselves, I mean, we said that they were, they, that they were moving towards Namibia, Botswana, but we very well know that Namibia has a very expanded and large desert. So why were they moving towards that direction where you know technically there is no water uh, it's very hot and the living conditions are almost impossible so when um, a living condition is impossible or it's very difficult for them to survive that's when they adopt a different lifestyle where they will have to learn how to survive in that area and the thing that takes people back there is that is a place for their ancestors where you'll find that uh, some of the sand people they are originated from Namibia, so that's where they will find most of the food and most of the medicine which they used to use uh, previously. So that's the reason people keep going back. And at the same time, you will find there is a group called Tumtumansi who lives in Chumque in Namibia. And they have the full right to gather and hunt in their ancestors' territory. So that's why you will find that the other people or the other <coughs> families of the two aunties who moved here in South Africa, they are moving back there because they see that their life has become easier in Chumque for them because they have to go and hunt and go and gather where they don't need money to go and buy meat or go and buy vegetables. Thank you. And then here we are. Uh, we will talk about our timeline. Before we go on to our timeline, show you guys classes refer. So this is where they found most of the evidence and there there is 25 meters layers deep where they will have to go and dig and find the evidence. So in some part of the layers they will not find evidence because that's the time when the coastline pulls back and they'll have to follow the coastline and go and eat seafood. 
but when they come back when the ice starts to melt and the coastline cools out that's when they are going to come back and that's where people find evidence that's where stone tools and those jewelries and things were found and then this is where our timeline is going to start so now we are in a time which is very hot so in that time the climate change kept on fluctuating or kept on changing it wasn't stable it's either it was ice cold in the ice age times or it's either very hot so that's why people have to keep on moving to eat or to survive so they'll have to find a way to solve their problems <coughs> so that's when you will find that people will go and go and eat seafood or come and eat your wachonias and then go to the water holes and that's where things happen so this is the stone tools that these people used at the time and it's only they carry it in their hand and these that you see here are secret stones that's why it's easier for them to sharpen it the moment you put it in fire and heat it in fire it becomes softened to take another stone and then sharpen it and then uh, they realize that that's a danger for themselves because they have to carry it in their hand and then come close to the animal come and kill the animal. So then they decided, why can't we take the stone and mount it on a projector? So then you will have to hunt from a distance. So then they mount it on a projector. So now it's easier for them to run after this animal and then they have to spear this animal. But at the same time, they are wasting energy because they have to run sometimes for a whole day. So then they decided, okay, let's make something smaller and they started making bow and arrow so when they started making bow and arrow it's saving them time they'll have to go and then hunt kill the animal and come back quickly to their cage and now they have time so when they have time they started doing artwork that's where art started hundred thousand years ago so if you see here you will see that there is a full toolkit of an artist a living stone there you will find in the shell there is a painting, a paint brush, so that was found in the Oblombos cave. And then they also started engraving, so that's when art started and engravings. So if you see over here, you'll find an egg, so that's where I could just try to show us that this egg was a whole egg, but because of the pressure of these layers, it broke into pieces, but they tried to put it together. Put it together show us how it was and then when art started and then sometimes we wonder as well what paintings did these people use to paint on the rock so the paintings they used was called ochre and this is the different ochre that you will find they were so clever they knew that if we take this rock we will get this kind of painting if we take that rock we will get this color painting and then also they didn't pass on this knowledge to us of this secret ingredient that they mix together to paint on the rocks so that it can stay there for a longer period. We only tried with water, we tried with animal blood and plant, but nothing helped. So now we are wondering what we can use to paint so that it can stay longer. And those paintings are very unique because some of them tell stories, some of them shows us what they have been doing at that time. With the hunting tools, um, also because um, for whoever um, is, is following this video, for the hunting tools, it's actually very important to mention that the animal population of the Cape was actually very different back yes. in the days. It's not the one that we know today. No. So at that time, animals were very big. That's why you will find a big spear. So these things that we see in this animation called ice age and then we say that it's a lie it's true there was big animals at that time and then if you go to your uh, fossil park you'll see these big bones of these big animals so they were big animals that they were hunting at that time and then to hunt an animal with only stone tool is a very different difficult thing so at that time these people's body were built big uh, so from this skull that was found in one of the caves, you can see that these people's head skull was totally different because they had a large forehead or a bigger forehead than these uh, humans that we will find today. 
so they were bigger build and they were also bigger animals than they were hunting at that time. Um, the I don't know if you're probably going to talk about it later as well, but there is a link with the Neanderthal men and the Sun people, right? So, um, you will find that uh, there is similarity in their culture and then similarity into what they do. So, I'm going to take an example of this. So, these are poison applicators. So, the archaeologists believe that if you take these poison applicators today, and then you wet it in the water, you'll still find the poison. So that's a strong poison that they used at that time. And then the larger version of it that you'll find it in that board, um, and then the dates, and then what they use it for. So we talk about the sand culture and the similarity. We can take the date. Uh, uh, after this ancient modern human or the early humans, you will find that the sand culture comes from about 4,000 years ago. So that's where you will find that it's used, the same tools that they use, the same jewelries that we are using today. That means that from these people, the sand people were born. From the early humans, the sand people were born. And from the sand people, the other people started to come out and then they moved in other directions in other continents. Probably not, this may be a silly question, but um, what is the link with other Western Africa populations? For instance, the Herero or the, um, the, the Himba, for instance. Because the way that I've seen the Himbas in Namibia, they're very similar in the way of um, uh, traditions and daily lifestyle. <clears throat> So, um, you will find that uh, the same people most of the time lived in Namibia, where you will find the other group called the Kamwas here. So, there you will find that um, they lived together with this, with this Himba or the Herero people. So, um, that's where you will find that uh, the same people also adapted the other lifestyle of this Herero people. When they were singing and dancing, they would use a drum. So, that's where the similarity comes with these tool groups. So some of the times things are inherited from, uh, inherited from other groups, some of the things are not originally from this particular group. So you will find that um, the same people inherited the playing drums from these Herero people and then also because they were living together they inherited uh, farming with like maybe with cows or farming with uh, mealy plants, farming with partners and all of those things. And then also there is a story that you will hear that um, a hero comes from the sand. The hero were born from the sand people. So that's why the similarities are there, but some people believe that it's true inherited things. Okay, what surprise are we going to get now? Let's see. So now we are going to walk outside and I'm going to show you guys some of the plants that still grows today that was used by these early humans in that time. Um, this is, uh, sorry if I interrupt you, but this is a very focal point of the African history because this is the meeting point of the Africans, the real Africans, um, which I don't know if many of you do know, but there were no black Africans living in this exact region. Um, here there was only the sons and the Africans were coming from the, we can probably point it on the map there, yeah. the African were coming more from uh, the big lakes of Central, do you, do you mind pointing it, um, <laughs> I'll lose the camera, um, yeah, they were coming more from the central part of Africa and yeah. the big lakes of Africa. So <clears throat> a lot of it, probably you will wonder why this part here, now I'm using the figure, yay, uh, this part here is actually quite empty. And that's because we've got a big Kalari desert there. Yes. So, um, where well, living conditions are not that easy because there is really no water. For whoever wants to take a, a screenshot, I'm just gonna uh, slowly move around this poster because this poster is very significant to understand the African history. Explain who are the same people and who are the 
Point principle and when did they arrive here? And then when they arrived here, what are the things that changed and then what happened into the lives of the same people? Did they get along? Uh, something very interesting in this poster is also to see how the houses used to look like. Scenes of daily life. Oops, sorry. So if you take the Germans, you look at the Kuiper, so that's how the Kuiper people build their houses. And then when we get to the Repeat of later, you will see how the same people used to build their houses. Good, thank you. And this, uh, in, under Table Mountain in Caitlin, for instance, you will see a lot of these caves and uh, sometimes something gets found still, but these were like the porch protecting you from the rain, but you will see how many there are under Table Mountain and how, how many times people were actually, as represented in, in these paintings or in these uh, um, pictures, how they used to gather together, spend time together, because the social life was actually very, very important. So now we are going to go outside <coughs> and then we are going to see the plantation that still grows today. I'm just going to give a quick screenshot for um, the history of colonialism and the sons. So whoever wants to take a screenshot or um, learn um, the, the relationship that it was between the Europeans and the sons. But I want to drive your attention into something and uh, you see this is something that they didn't know at all. But these are just the representations of the vessels they were arriving with. And look at even the women, how they had the dresses. It's incredible. Just the, um, while in Europe we were having uh, historical records of um, facts that happened. Here the paintings and the cave paintings were actually, um, as um, it was explained earlier in the first room that we saw, it was scenes of daily life, scenes of mourning, scenes of um, um, acceptance or unacceptance of um, the various cultures. So I am gonna pass the word again to uh, Nashada who is talking to us about something very interesting now. So, uh, if you can remember, I was talking about uh, the tools that was found in the cave. And then these are uh, some of the things that was also found. This one is not the original one, it's a duplicated one. So this one is a digging stick that they used in the past and also the sand are also using it today. So I'm going to show you guys how to use the digging stick and how to also carry it because there is a stone and this stone is to make it heavier so that it can dig deeper into the ground so you can dig out your tubers and your bulbs. Technology of the time. And engineering of the time. Yes. So here we find a plant called beer root. So beer root, uh, when it comes to the sand people, I'm not going to talk about the uh, ancient people or the modern humans or the early people, I'm going to talk about the sand people now. So when it comes to the sand people, they use the beer root, they dig out the root and then they stamp it and they put it into a water for uh, maybe like four to three days and then they will take honey and some berries, they will put it together and with that water of the beer root, they will mix the honey and the berries together and they will let it stand for maybe three to two weeks and that's when their beer is going to be ready to drink. So the beer root was used to make beer. So thanks to the lockdown, we could have done that too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, 
many of you may know, uh, South Africa had an alcohol ban during uh, the time of uh, COVID and when we had the complete lockdown. Look at this beauty. Isn't this just amazing? And carrying it on the shoulder is exactly how it gets carried. Yeah. Uh, this is the manual of instructions, actually. Yeah. <coughs> so maybe you come to your exact point uh, of your gathering, and then also you have to put your digging stick there. Maybe on, on your gathering you'll maybe find that it's a very dry time and only this thing is sticking out. So this is how big your tuber is. Sometimes you'll get bigger ones. So then you will kneel down and then you take your digging stick. So what you'll actually do is, so this one is already digged out. So what you will do is you will start from this side to dig and not this side because you don't know how big this tuber is. And then at some point if you start digging it this side, you are going to damage it. So that's why people start digging at this side, so that they can know where it's going. And then after digging it, what they will do is they take out the tuber, so that they can hear if it's ripe, or it's ready to be eaten, or they can drink the water from it. So what they actually do is you take it, you find it, and you take it and you squeeze it. Using your, uh, your thumb, that's how you're going to drink the water and that's also something for them to eat for for the babies they don't eat meat so they're all obviously going to eat tubers so you get different kinds of tubers you get a medicinal one you get an edible one which also is a water to drink and then you get a poisonous tuber so that's why it's uh, very important for a sun a lady or a sun girl to start learning gathering so that she can differentiate the plants comes from an Afrikaans word. Kwe means at the old time they used to say kwe is a bed. So the kwe hood was used as a mattress. So this is also one of the plants that was found in the cave. So kwe hood is also an insect repellent. So I'm going to carry this and then at the end of the day we are going to see what we are going to do with this kwe hood in my hand. I'll buy it straight away. <laughs> <coughs> you can enjoy the beauty of the Atlantic and it gets drier and drier this is the road to Namibia you will see actually a road down here and uh, this is actually the road to Namibia and it's just getting worse and worse the further you go up because the land becomes more and more and more desertic with an ocean on the other side and um, one of the seven natural wonders of the planet right ahead of us you can see it that's table mountain it's very faded you can't see it very well because we are quite a few kilometers away probably about 80 kilometers um, sorry the wind has moved the camera but table mountain is actually visible from this distance so it's a good clear day today So beetle is a berry that they used to eat and beetle is not, was not found in the caves because the people eat these things and then they leave it in the bush and then it gets uh, decomposed. So the beetle, uh, it's an energy food but they also knew how much they must eat for the energy because if you eat too much then it's going to make you feel sleepy. So this is what they collect on their way going for a hunt, they can eat it for uh, gaining much energy or collect some of them for their kids. Who's the sleeping tablet back in the days probably? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that is your beetle. And I am talking about
about gathering and hunting so now i will have to talk about women's uh, health so this is acapenthes so acapenthes is used for when a woman is in labor and then her constructing pain is, is worse and then she's struggling uh, to give birth so they are going to dig out food and they are going to make a tea of these acapenthes and they are going to give it her to drink so when she drinks this thing it's going to help with the contraction pain and also it's going to help her easier her birth and then she's going to give birth to the baby strongly I would like you to sh I would like to show you the details of these beautiful I can call it garden right yes uh, it's written in white but just have a look uh, women's health and child care and beauty so they were really getting everything from the plants um, I can't see because of the reflection but I'm sure that you guys have picked up the picture already and this is your snake berries snake berries is also one of the energy food that they used to eat they only eat it when it's red when it's green it's toxic you don't eat it but also it's tricky when it's red you have to look for a black dot if there's a black dot on it which means there is insect in it and if you eat it it's going to give you stomach complaint or it's going to make worms in your stomach so that's, that's what, what you have to know it's red yes i can eat it but is there a black dot on it and if there's a black dot i don't eat it because it's going to be So these are the perfumes that they use for their body and also to wash their face with these things, especially the rose pelagonium, they used to wash their face with it. And also the camphor pelagonium is also an insect repellent. So this type of thing that you see here is a poison, so I don't know how it ended up here with the woman's beauty, it's supposed to be on the hunting side. Uh, that's an immune system booster so today we take four medicinal plants and then we mix it together to make a tea or to brew a tea so you take the cancer bush uh, and then you take the wild wormwood over here the wild wormwood is good for cold and flu and for stomach complaint and also if somebody has a wound and then this wound is taking uh, too long to recover or get well they will take the leaf of the wild wormwood and then they will burn the leaves and then will mix it with animal fat and then they will apply on the wound so this medicine will help the wound uh, to get healed quickly um, obviously these are all plants that are original from the cape so from this region yes. um, during the time I mean up after the you know the, the, the uh, many many populations were actually curing themselves like that but the, one question that I have is um, is there um, a verification from botanics uh, or uh, um, people that are involved in the alternative medicine uh, or it's just part of the tradition it's just part of fact a tea that they were talking about from Madagascar that was um, a COVID repellent we can call it like that yeah that that, that, that uh, includes wild wormwood so it also includes this plant in that tea which they say is uh, medicine for COVID-19 which we also believe that uh, it can help people with it because we had many cases uh, our friends in
I have a question for you as well because a lot of medicinal plants uh, you were talking about wounds you were talking about uh, um, uh, healing of I don't know anything that could have happened to the muscles or the skins um, clearly this region is a very is a region that is very populated is strongly populated by snakes we know the puff feathers we know the boom slangs and the cape cobras and walking in spaces like this it's not unusual to find one of those snakes um, do you know if they had any remedy, which is very difficult because a bite of those snakes uh, is neurotoxins, uh, nitrotoxins, um, do you know, to your knowledge, if they had something against the snake bites? several uh, creatures that in the bush very often we say um, you need to be careful you need to be more worried about uh, what you don't see than what you see because there are some little insects and little bugs that are extremely terrible they they would actually kill you like a tick bite uh, leading to tick bite fever I mean this is obviously very popular in many other countries but um, because of their position in animals, uh, the climate and many other factors, a tick bite can actually take you to the end of your life. Sure that a lot of people fi will find this information very very useful I mean um, animal bites I mean the insect bites and uh, snake bites it's a reality that in South Africa is very vivid and very strong so what I will say uh, most of our people were not bit, uh, bitten by snakes by the snakes because that, uh, they know that if you see a snake just leave a snake to go or follow it or try to take it but because the snakes if you are
I trust you. <laughs> well, we also see that even for COVID, we find a solution that was, uh, or oh, a partial solution that was uh, already adopted uh, probably 4,000 years ago, if not more. Now, in this area specifically, is there any evidence of paintings, of Bushman paintings, or... Um, plants sorry it's uh, very much like uh, with all these um, little posts that we see uh, on the floor it's very much like walking into a mix between a botanical garden and uh, and a pharmacy an homeopathic pharmacy yeah. <laughs> I apologize for my uh, cough sometimes that keeps on coming up, but that's the leftovers of COVID. <laughs> So many cooking programs going on, and please correct me if I'm wrong. There is no sun cuisine. So let's have a look at what uh, we are going to find and uh, the incredible. Um, 
can call them spices, but we can call them uh, ingredients that are actually going into the pots and what we are going to eat. But please note these uh, uh, beautiful recreations of um, the houses. This is where they used to live. Isn't this just wonderful? Oh, there was always a fire. Um, but I think you would like to, to discuss something about the fire because it's very important. sometimes celebration day and story ray or they will do the healing day so the fire is always in the center and then you do the like uh, for the same people the head will be circled around and the doors will be always facing the center so imagine this is your rock shelter that you are and then under the table is quite good and i'm going to put it right in here because that we have uh, building our own mattress so maybe I don't know in the future the archaeologists will come and they will also come and find our mattress or they will find our shell middens over there so when one finishes eating their muscles they can go and put their shell middens there so that's our own rabbits that we are Making Mussels were very popular in the diets of the suns, so that's why right over here you actually see so many shells. It's literally a cemetery of shells and uh, other bones from other animals. So, yes, so you will find there is an inland skull and then inland bones here. So, because we really didn't know much about days or years and days so for people if they kill the animal they put the bone there so that um that's the remembrance of this is the time when my child was born maybe i killed the inland when my child was born or maybe my mom died when i killed the inland and then also you will find the shell maidens is where they put everything together so some of